to the doctor is in hello everybody and welcome to the doctor is in relatable reliable and real information for our sisters surviving breast cancer i am your co-host dr monique gary dr mo i am a breast surgical oncologist in the greater philadelphia area and i'm here with my co-host ricky fairley Hey, I'm Ricky Fairley. I'm an eight-year survivor of triple negative breast cancer and a passionate advocate. I know my purpose and my passion is to talk about breast health, so we are so glad you're with us here tonight. And we are ready to talk about breast cancer and the impact of COVID and all the things that we're dealing with right now in the world. So I want to start by introducing my breasty and dear friend, sweetie pie, Shante Drakeford. Hi, um, my name is Shante Drayford. Um, I like to say that I am surviving. Uh, for like five years now, I've had stage four metastatic breast cancer that has metastasized to my lungs, my hip, my rib, and multiple spots in my spine. And before COVID, I always was already protective and now i'm just even more protective but you know i'm coping as best as i can thanks for that i want to introduce my breastie uh ayana moncrief ayana say hi to everybody tell us a little hi. bit about yourself hi everyone i'm so excited to be here and spending this evening with you all um i am also a currently surviving breast cancer um i was diagnosed in 2016 um, it currently in treatment and doing very well. Um, professionally, I work in human resources, so and in, primarily in the healthcare industry. So I have lots of thoughts to offer in regards to how this is impacting me as someone who's surviving sir, um, in a circle of my sisterhood, in addition to kind of being at the front lines from the employer standpoint um, and supporting people. Um, who you know are dealing with the impact, economic impact more so of, of the COVID pandemic. Ayana, we're definitely gonna have you back to talk about that. We're gonna do a whole piece on um, just financial toxicity and financial navigation for our sisters. This first episode is called The New New Normal because I can't tell you how many of uh, cancer survivors and those who are surviving our metavivors and our thrivers uh, you hear that phrase at some point in their journey. Well, this is your new normal. This is what life is like for you. And with COVID-19 right now, this is what life is like for all of us. We are all isolated and we are all trying to connect with each other through social media and so I wanted to talk to you guys about your new normal um, so so Shante just um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll let Ricky ask you the questions but tell us some more about what's going on in your day-to-day -day life yeah. all right so uh, yeah so I'm a nurse practitioner by trade and when everything started to really hit home pretty much at the beginning of March I had like this guilt of going into the clinic and I had like should I go in should I not go in because I'm called immunocompromised and yes I still work with people who are sick but I've always been careful anyway I've always had hand sanitizer I've always had the mask and then I saw wipes and things of that nature but now this is like a whole nother level and it intensified so I was guilty guilty about going to work uh, or not going to work. And so my supervisor, um, the physician I work with, she was very understanding and she understand um, what I'm going through. And she was like, you know what? Um, you can just do telemedicine. You don't have to put yourself at risk. And that made me feel good because I feel like I am still able to help my patients without feeling like I'm abandoning them. And just like on my day-to-day -day base, um, being inside is kind of like not. It's not my normal because I'm an extrovert. I'm very social. I'm always with my friends. And so I had to learn to kind of cope. Just yesterday, I had like almost like a panic attack from cabin fever. And I just did some yoga. I meditated. But I also live on a farm. And I kind of live almost already in isolation. Not a lot of neighbors near me. So I live on two acres of land. I have chickens, I have dogs, I have my husband, video games. Um, I'm very active. So I always just go out and I walk and I exercise every day with my virtual um, trainer. So I just kind of been coping. Tomorrow I have treatment for the first time. So this will be my kind of first time leaving the house in three weeks. So I'm a little afraid, but I have to get treatment and I can't let fear, you know, rule me and run me. I just 
it's out of my control, just like when I got cancer, it's out of my control. And I've always kind of kept a positive attitude about it. And it's difficult, but I'm trying to, like you said, learn a new, new normal for myself. Yeah. Thank you for that. Ayana, tell us about you. How are you doing with things? How's your daily life impacted by this? Yeah, thank you. So, you know, my my daily life has been significantly impacted. I um, am primarily a person who, um, you know, from the HR perspective, I'm dealing with people all the time, right? I'm in conversations and um, holding meetings and so forth and so on. Um, so obviously with, you know, from the COVID employer standpoint, many companies are shut down. Many people um, have been laid off. Um, I think it's been very difficult for me um, balancing, you know, understanding the business perspective um, as I'm in the front line. I'm laying people off just this week. I've laid off about 15 people um, more last week. Um, so I, I, you know, it's a struggle to understand the impact I'm having directly on people's lives. Um, from the personal standpoint, you know, I'm handling things the best that I can. You know, I, um, I'm definitely used to isolation and, um, you know, being a person who's been in cancer treatment for quite some time, you know, we are told by our healthcare providers to, you know, be very careful with being around others and, you know, continue to wash your hands. And so we practice so much of the guidelines that we're now seeing being pushed and communicated throughout the media in regards, to, you know, from the CDC. Um, it's, so it's been interesting how, you know, seeing how other people are reacting to the fact that, yes, there's this virus, this illness that you can catch that, you know, that people unfortunately are having um, fatal outcomes from, you know, I, I live with a diagnosis, um, you know, that potentially, you know, will have a fatal outcome. So it's been, it's been hard to, to see that dynamic um, be realized with other people. Um, but, you know, definitely uh, practicing an attitude of gratitude and, and leveraging the fact that we're here, we have good health care, um, you know, and, and just trying to be supportive to everyone I come in contact with. Yeah, thanks you know, for I was, that. I was making a, making a joke, you know, kind of that, you know, if we could have said, all you have to do is wash your hands and stay home and you won't get sick and die. What a concept, you know, like, you know, yeah. you know, we face it every day as survivors and, and, um, you know, it, it seems so, so trivial now, but, you know, people are really struggling to shelter at home and follow the rules and, and take care of themselves and take care of other people. It's not about what, how you're going to get sick, but how are you going to, are you going to pass it on to somebody else? I mean, the several people that I know that actually have COVID have no idea how they got it. Yeah. They probably got it from someone who didn't know they had it. And, yeah. um, you know, it's a, it's a crazy, crazy disease. You know, that, that's, that's so true. And I think it, it really, um, we're going to talk in a little bit about anxiety and, and some of the, the stress and the emotions. But uh, Shantae, you've got treatment tomorrow, you mentioned. And I, I wonder, has your treatment plan and your medical care changed any, the, either the delivery, the ways you're interacting with your doctors? Has anything been different as far as your, your treatment? And Ayana, I'm going to ask the same question of you. Have there been any changes in your, your care plans or things that, you know, kind of went a little bit off course? And, and, and if so, do you understand what's going on? Can you hear me? So I so I'll jump in as it relates to me. I um I uh you know I I am currently still in treatment. Mm -hmm. I um meeting with my doctor you know every three weeks and you know we go through the our course of treatment. Um my meet my appointment this week was actually postponed. Um due to the fact that I'm doing very well, my levels are very good. Um, and so they're trying to, you know, not let people who are as more susceptible to um, catching something, you know, be in right now. So my, my appointment was pushed back till next week, um, you know, in hopes that, you know, things will hopefully be a little quieted down. Um, they're also talking to me about perhaps seeking treatment at one of the remote sites that's not as, um, you know, busy and not as, um, you know, uh, having as much people there um, to lessen my risk of exposure. So that's definitely a, a huge change. Obviously, I'm um, typically used to getting my appointment regularly and not, you know, um, worrying so much about the level of people around in that clinical setting.
Shante, how about you? Can you hear me now? We have a little bit of a technical difficulty. Yeah, let's see if I can see. Hi, I can hear you, Ricky. Um, you can hear me. I know. I was just saying, I think that's really great that they're giving you an alternative place to go. So you yeah. feel a little more secure about going in, you know, you sort of see these pictures of hospitals where there's, you know, the, the COVID tent outside and it looks like you have to sort of go buy it or past it. It's so ominous, you know, and yeah. we see these long lines of cars, you know, waiting for the test and like, you yeah. know, long, you know, in a parking lot. It's so crazy. It just adds like, it's like doomsday is out there, you know? It, it does. It adds a little bit of fear and anxiety. One of the things that my healthcare provider is doing, and I'm sure Dr. Gary, your um, health institution is doing the same thing, is they're consistently calling me, um, you know, in the days up to say, you know, you the country have both to your knowledge. Do you have any symptoms? Um, so, you know, going through that intake process is, you know, I'm sure part of their uh, sourcing process, if you will, to just make sure that people that they're bringing into the, the building um, right, won't expose case. those currently in there getting treatment. And also trying to then identify, making sure that I am okay. Um, and then being able to then triage, right? To say, you know, if you're okay, and if you can perhaps just hold on another week, you know, they're using these beds and they're using these uh, clinical uh, patient areas to really um, reserve them for the people who need the care. I think one thing that's also been really interesting from the employment standpoint and the healthcare standpoint is the fact that I work for a company uh, with sites all across the country. Um, I am dealing with COVID positives every day. So I think I'm mm -hmm. at my fifth positive now um, from an employee that I'm personally responsible for from the HR perspective. Um, and one of the first things that they ask us for, you know, after we tell them we're going to all clean the buildings and that we tell them we're going to, you know, make sure that we allow people to work from home or make sure that we kind of put all these contingencies in place. One of the first things that these people are asking for is PPE. Um, you know, that personal protective equipment for them to be able to then safeguard. And obviously, you know, we're checking CDC and we're checking all the different um, outlets to see if we can purchase it. And of course, they're being, they're telling us that we need to reserve it for healthcare providers as, as a result of the shortage. Yeah, I hope there's enough of that to go around, right? We hope, hope we're all so. praying for that, right? Yeah, yeah. it's important. So Shante, how about your, your treatment? Has everything kind of been consistent or have there been some modifications to, uh, to what's going on with your care plan? Well, basically, typically I go in every four weeks and um, I get my refill on my oral medications that I take and I get injections. And what I've been told, because I emailed my provider, I asked, was there anything different? Um, and I have to get labs done and like get my medications in the pharmacy. So I know that's going to cause me to be around other people. And what I was told is that um, basically is everything's the same except for like the pharmacy is going to be curbside. The lab is pretty much the same. But, you know, just kind of try to stay away um, from people as much as possible. So tomorrow I will see, I know there's a different separate entrance for me to go through and then they will screen everyone for COVID symptoms. And if you do have positive COVID symptoms, they immediately send you to the COVID tent to get testing. And then after that, you can go, if it's necessary to go get treatment or get your, um, get cancel your appointment or something. But we'll see tomorrow. Um, I, I go get treatment on a military base, so I'm sure it's going to be even more secure and more structured and probably scarier too. So we'll see. Well, let, let's, let's deal with the real here. So let's, let's get really real because, you know, this is a lot of stress. It's a lot of anxiety. There's this, it, it's all heightened for us. And, you know, people have their different outlets. You know, some of us are extroverts and we go out with friends and we, you know, we have our happy hours and our, our, um, our boozy brunches and other things that we like to do. Some people like to do retail therapy, but what are you doing, truly doing that's helping you cope with your anxiety and your stress, whether it's positive or whether it's something that you want to work on, like give us the real on how you're going to manage the stress. Uh, for me, like I mentioned earlier, I have like a lot of little things I could do. I, I just tend to my chickens and um, I'm getting more chickens. I'm trying to create more hobbies. I just was helping my husband split wood. Like he loves to do outdoor things. 
Um, he try to keep my mind occupied. I'm a big gamer, so I play video games all day almost. Um, I read, I listen to podcasts, um, I sleep. I have a virtual trainer, so I do my workouts every day. I try to get my friends to do it. At night, we do Zoom parties, and I'm, like, on a, a platform called Marco Polo with them. And so we talk all day, and then I cook. I mean, but, you know, like I said, yesterday, I was, like, washing my dishes, and I was, like, crying. Like, oh, my God. Like, I'm not going to see my friends to physically touch them like that. I like, you know, that energy is just, like, weird for me. So, but, I mean, so far I've been doing okay, you know, besides yesterday. And I don't know how I will be doing in the future, but I'm going to try to keep myself occupied as much as I can. Yeah. So, so for me, um, in terms of how I'm keeping myself busy, just me personally, I'm, I'm pretty wired to, um, uh, be okay with isolation, right? I'm definitely more of an introvert. Uh, so um, you know, being at home and kind of, you know, being in quarantine, if you will, semi-quarantine um, has been kind of my, similar to my just normal. Um, I do think I cope the best just checking in on others, you know, so, you know, mm -hmm. calling friends and checking in with family members just to make sure that they're okay and that they have everything that they need, um, you know, and just trying to just make sure, you know, I'm checking in patients that really lifts my spirit. Um, outside of that, I, I Netflix and chill. <laughs> um, so I, it's, it's not been as difficult as, a, as adjustment for me, but, um, but yeah, I, I definitely just make sure I, I get excited and comfort, but just making sure everyone I know and love is okay. I've never watched so much Netflix in my life until yeah. the past three weeks. <laughs> really? I never was like a real big TV person, but I've watched everything. <laughs> it's out of control. It's out of control now. It's crazy. So what do you, what advice do you want to give people? Like, you know, we have all of our breasties are out there and, you know, some of us are introverts, some of us are extroverts. We're all, but we're all dealing with this like new pressure. I feel like it's, I feel like it's like a pressure. I feel like I'm like in this bubble of like with my family, which is great, but, but, um, what can we tell people? What can you impart to them to say, okay, because we don't know how long this is going to last. We don't know how long we're going to be in this craziness, right? So what can we share with people that are, you know, will give them that ray of hope or that will make their tears go away, Shantae, when they start to cry? Like, you know, what can we tell people that can help them deal, you know, and help them get through this? Any ideas for, you know, how you can help others? I just say like, you know, cope with it how you can. Like there's no wrong way to essentially cope with it. It's just like, you know, when I got cancer, everyone was like, why are you so positive? Why are you so happy? And you know, that's the way I cope with it. I can't control it. So I'm not gonna really worry on it if I can't control it, but that's just me. And if you wanna be angry, be angry. You wanna be happy, be happy. You wanna eat everything, eat everything, you know, just, <laughs> I just think in moderation, right? You know, every little thing in moderation, cry a little bit, be mad a little bit, be happy a little, well, a lot bit, happy a lot bit. Um, you know, like, just cope how you feel like you can cope and just ask others. Like, I think getting advice from other people um, and staying off, like, the, you know, unplugging. You know, I think unplugging is very essential. Some people I know that sit there all day literally and watch like CNBC and CNN and all these new things all day every day about COVID-19. I'm like, that's just gonna like dilute you and just like take away all your, your everything. So I just think, you know, cope with it how you can, but like unplug a little too. Take this time and see it as a positive and not as a negative. It's a silver lining and everything, you know, so that's how I see it. Yeah, um, you know, for me, I think, I, I'm, I'm learning so much about myself in this process, right? Mm -hmm. I'm learning that um, I need to continue to maintain an attitude that's focused on being grateful. I think gratitude brings me and centers me in a really good place. I think that this whole experience, obviously being impacted by breast cancer, being involved in this global pandemic, right? I think it's really humanized me right to a, another level to just make sure i'm consistently grateful for everything that i have this 
in this lives, which has been kind of taken, we've our freedom has been taken, right? So many people have lost jobs, right? They're, they, you know, we don't have access to money or, you know, all these resources that we once, you know, it could have taken for granted, right? I, I think one thing that I definitely am, am meditating on and being, you know, thankful for is just my attitude of gratitude. Um, more operationally, I think that this experience too um, has taught me to uh, make sure that I'm talking to people in our breast cancer community and all communities, actually just about being prepared, right? Preparedness. I think, you know, this has really shown us that, you know, things can change very quickly. Um, things happen in our lives that are unexpected. So where are our areas of vulnerability as patients, as professionals, as perhaps parents or, you know, whatever it is, where are our areas of vulnerability and make sure that we have really good contingency plans, right? I.e. one looks like, you know, unfortunately, like I said, coming from the HR profession, um, I've just had to lay off several people who, you know, some had contingency plans and they're like, well, Ayana, listen, you know, I kind of stockpiled some money and I put money away and I, you know, were, were thoughtful enough to prepare it, you know, for something that unfortunately may have happened, right? They had uh, allocated finances for, you know, a rainy day, if you will. Um, and then I'm talking to other people who are telling me that, you know, Ayana, like I, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. Sometimes my, you know, paycheck is barely cutting it. How, how am I supposed to now navigate and move forward? So, you know, that's one of the, you know, I, you know, biggest things that I'm learning in terms of how I'm, ta I'm, I'm talking to people and, and communicating some of the really real impact that's having is just being prepared financially, having contingency plans for difficult life situations um, that may happen that you might not have been really, um, you know, ready for, but, you know, how awesome it is for, for those who were prepared um, and who were thoughtful and, and, you know, put some resources away. I, I love that you said that because, you know, in, in my, my online physician groups, um, many of my colleagues and friends are, are on the front line. They're emergency physicians. They're anesthesiologists. Yeah. We're surgeons, you know, and um, cancer doesn't quarantine. So care yeah. continues. It's only Wednesday and I already have five new patients who I had to call and give a diagnosis to. And so this yeah. is some great advice and wisdom to help give to them. But, you know, as far as the, the medical professionals, you know, a lot of um our families are, are two physician families and what happens if both parents are exposed and you know we're now kind of grappling with what do we do with our children and making sure that there are wills and people are writing letters yes. to their kids in the yes. event that maybe they won't be able to come home or they yeah. have to quarantine elsewhere and so it's a really scary and interesting time to think about you know getting your your affairs uh, in order from that perspective so you can be a little bit more prepared um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, mm -hmm. I've had to become the caregiver for my grandkids and help my kids out. Wow. You know, they're both working at home and we have a nine month old and a two and a half old and two and a half year old. And, and I'm usually the nanny on Mondays and you know, I'm 63. They are kicking my butt. I go home and I'm dead at night, you know, but, but, yeah. I mean, yeah. but, we, but we, you know, the nanny's husband is a bus driver and he's still working and we couldn't expose her to our family bubble. And yeah. so it's like, you know, it's, either me or the nanny because I'm, my immune system is compromised. And so either I have to, you know, be all the way in or not. And so I am. And so we have, we take, you know, four hour shifts with the kids, but between, you know, my daughter, my son-in-law, my other daughter is a teacher. She's still actually, you know, doing online school. So she comes around every now and then, but it's, you know, us and the children. And, but that's the choice our family has made to deal with the sheltering. And, you know, we're just, okay, let's see how long we can make this work. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's, it's good that you said that too, Ayana, because um, when I got diagnosed and I couldn't work, I'm a nurse. I've been, I've been a nurse for like 12 years. I was a registered nurse and I worked in almost every department, but at that time I was working labor and delivery, which I love. And I was on crutches for like six months and I could not do my job. And I was like, what else am I going to do without being a nurse? And at that time I was in school for nurse practitioner. I had to stop my clinicals and everything like that. So like you said, like your your life stops and you have to think and be prepared. And that taught my husband and I, like we always kind of lived off of one income anyway. So that helped out. But also it helped me, my husband told me, you need to reinvent yourself. Just in case you can't go back, what are you going to do? You need to reinvent yourself. And I was like, what? 
And it really was true. So then I started doing teaching. So now I'm a childbirth educator and that kind of like helped me. And now even during this time, I'm still able to be employed because I, I finished my schooling as an MP and now they have telemedicine, which is very convenient. And I get to teach still with um, childbirth education virtually. And it's just like, you know, you got to really try to create a reinvention of yourself on how to prepare. I did my will when I got diagnosed. Um, we did all those things. And like you said, you never really think about it until you're like in it. And so uh, that was a really good point that you had said that. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I appreciate you sharing that. You know, even, you know, how you're mentioning Will, you know, again, you know, people are now asking me at the highest, Ayana, who's my beneficiaries on file, right? If you have any insurance policies, um, Wills, just being very thoughtful. I guess, you know, this whole idea of, you know, this vulnerability, if you will, has created a heightened sense of people to now have those hard conversations that perhaps they weren't really looking to have before, right? Whereas I, my will and everything, it's already set up. I already know, right? I am already prepared for that way. But so many others hadn't, haven't been thoughtful in that way because, you know, we, we hadn't had, they hadn't had to. Um, so this COVID um, has really forced people to, to think about those contingency plans and to put money away and to, you know, dig into their 401ks and look at some investments and making sure that they organize their documents and that their loved ones know where they are, all these different things. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not been an easy reality, but definitely, um, you know, it's had an impact on a lot of people to, to continue to help them think and um, be prepared for, unfortunately, you know, some difficult times that may come. Sounds like there's some huge life lessons from survivors and from those who are enduring and surviving breast cancer because you have already, like you said, put, you know, a good deal of thought into these things. And, and I think, um, you know, this information is so good, not just for those sisters who are going through an, uh, treatment and dealing with breast cancer, but it sounds like this is something that everybody could, could really use. Um, I got a question for everybody. What are you looking forward to when this is all over and we all finally get off the of detention and Mother Nature says we can go back outside again? What are you looking forward to? Hugs. I'm hugging my babies and my family. I miss hugging my friends. I miss my friends. I miss being with my friends and just hanging out and, you know, walking to Starbucks with my friends. I usually walk every day, you know, with a, bunch, a group of friends and now we're like walking across the street or, and then one of them was exposed. So we had to kick him out of the group. And I just want to be with my friends, you know, my family, my friends and get more hugs, not enough hugs, never enough hugs. Yes, you know me, I'm an energy hoarder. So I'm like energy, 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 give me all of it. And like hugs and kisses. And like back to traveling, you know, I've always been a traveler before cancer. I travel even more after cancer. Now I'm just going to travel even more and more because of the COVID. So I just, just need to travel some more. But I need to go snowboarding again. I haven't snowboarded in like a year. I'm going crazy. But yeah, that's what I want to do. Yeah. So it's funny. I mean, there's two answers, right? I think, um, you know, there's a, my, the, the, major side of me that agrees with Ricky. I, I can't wait to connect with friends and family members um, and, you know, obviously cherish those moments that I haven't had those touch points in a while. Um, but I'm also looking forward to stock market to rebound, right? Because, you know, you buy low, you sell high and uh, can't wait to see, you know, hopefully when our economy self-corrects uh, eventually and see um, what that'll look like. Well, I'm looking what forward about you, to Monique? I'm looking forward to seeing the ocean. I want to see the water. <laughs> I want to spend some good time. I want to drive down. I want to see the farm because Shante, what you don't know is I'm shopping for a farm. Do you have baby goats? <laughs> It's funny, so my husband and I, we talk about what kind of animals we're going to get. So right now we got chickens. We're thinking about we're going beekeeping. We're setting up some swarms. Um, ducks maybe coming in May. We ordered more chickens, so we have more coming. We sell our eggs. Um, goat is on the list, but goats are like, you know, uh, they're very lovable creatures. And I don't, I, you know, I, I, I am a, eat, I eat my, you know, Everything. I haven't done it yet, but I will. But like, I don't know. Goats is just like 
but they're good for their milk and everything. So my husband keeps going from a, a goat and a cow. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do a cow. <laughs> but if you get one goat, you have to get two. So I don't know. We'll you have to get two. I like the little pygmy goats. It's so cute. We could do goat <laughs> yoga. I want to come down. I want to learn farming from you guys. I'm looking forward to coming down to Ricky's. I want to see the yeah, water. You can come and to I, my beach. Absolutely. To the beach and I want to go to some good restaurants again. Get some oh, yeah. good seafood. I want to support small businesses. Perhaps. Sidewalk Ooh. cafe. I'm an introvert, but I want to be outside. So I'm looking forward to seeing all you guys face to face. That's definitely <laughs> for sure. I miss my mom. You know, I'm, I'm with my mom a lot, you know, and so yeah. she's, thank God she's in a senior living situation and they're like on lockdown where she needs to be. But I miss, you know, being, I'm usually with her at least once a week all day with the kids. And so I want my mom hug again, you know, so we'll all get there. We'll all get through this. And I think, you know, I think we, we are learning a lot about our, ourselves, how we think about being in isolation and finding who are, finding our center. Like, I feel like we're fi I'm finding my center and what really makes me tick as a person because I've been alone so much. So I think we're all going to come out of the saying, you know, here's what we want. Here's how we're going to live differently and, and interact differently and cherish the things, you know, when you do, when we do have people around us cherishing those moments even more. Absolutely. Ricky, one last question. Sure. It's your favorite question. It's my favorite question. Mm -hmm. What is it? It's what's your inspiration to keep going? That's what right. inspires you? Oh. Yep. What inspires you guys? What inspires you? What just wakes you up in the morning and keeps you going? Yeah, that's a good question. Never really had to think about it. Um, I think my purpose in life, right? So I'm in a field that I like to help. And that's like my main drive. Like I volunteer, I like to help. I So that's my drive. But like having a sense of purpose um, always helps me. That's why I'm a, you know, a cancer advocate and things like that. And whatever can help me pull that purpose further, I feel like I'm at peace. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, Dante, a great answer. I think for me, I, I get inspired by growth, right? I love the idea that I get to grow and learn every day. And I'm inspired by my personal growth, my personal journey. I'm also inspired by my ability to support other people in their growth moments as well. So um, that's what keeps me going. How about you, Ricky? My grandbabies. Bell and Leia, they inspire me. And, and I guess this breast cancer fight is for them. I don't want them to ever speak the words breast cancer in their lifetime. I don't want them to ever have to deal with this disease. And so that's why I fight every day. I know that God left me here with the purpose of talking about breast health and they inspire me every, every day when I wake up, okay, how are we gonna, what are we gonna do today to fix this problem? I love it. I guess for me, it's it's two things. It's my family, and uh, also it, it's my patients. You know, this is this profession for me is more than just my job. It it really is a calling to to be able to help patients through surgery and and even more through the relationships that we're building and the ways that we can connect and talk about how to make life better as a result of of this diagnosis. You know, so. Um, it, it really, um, cancer doesn't quarantine. It doesn't stop. The care continues. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I have to be there for my patients. And so it inspires me every single day when I see them have those breakthrough moments when they say, you know what, this happened to me, but it doesn't define me. I'm going to get through this. When they change their diets and lifestyles, when they finally realize that, you know, you got to deal with your stress or your stress is going to deal with you. Right. You know, when they finally are able to, to see some sense of purpose as a result of, of their, their trial and their diagnosis, that for me is just, it's, it's everything. So um, it, it inspires me to keep going absolutely every day. Well, I want to thank you guys so much for joining me. This has thank been fun. So much. Uh, it's it's so been much. incredible and um, really inspirational. You guys inspire me, both of you. And so I have a new breastie. Uh, <laughs> Shante, I'll be down to see you in the farm because I want to yeah. learn beekeeping too. Mm -hmm. And um, Ayana, I know you told me, you said, I need to, I need to lay ears on you and you're going to take me swimming when the summer hits. We're we going swimming everywhere. We're gutting in the ocean. We're diving in a deep end. 
we're getting in the deep end. Well, come to my house. You know, I paddleboard <laughs> a lot. I'm like, I'm at the beach. Let's bring it. There you go. We'll have it. We'll have a reunion and we'll do it in person. Our, our next episode is going to give you the most up-to-date guidelines for what you need to know about being diagnosed, undergoing treatment and surveillance. And so we're going to have some medical professionals join us next time and some members of the care team. And they're going to talk about, you know, how care, how cancer care is happening uh, during COVID-19 and what you need to know because the treatment guidelines are changing right now. And so where you might have had surgery, you might be put on a pill instead of maybe doing chemotherapy after surgery, you might be doing your chemo beforehand now. And so we want to break it down for everybody to understand. And so if you or your loved one are undergoing treatment and your management has been impacted by this, we want to hear from you so that we can make sure we answer your questions. Um, please message us on Instagram, Dr. Monique Gary on Instagram, Ricky Dove on Instagram. Is that correct, Ricky? Instagram and Twitter, Ricky Dove, R-I-C-K-I-D-O-V-E. -E. Yep. Instagram and Twitter. You can find me on Instagram, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and the Facebook. Yep. Uh, and message us with your questions and your stories. And in the meantime, we want you to take care of yourselves and, and be, be gentle with yourselves. As, as Shante said, you know, however you are dealing with this, there's no wrong way. You know, as long as you are loving and authentic with yourselves and know that the sisters have your back and you are never, ever alone. So until next time, everybody, take care and be well. The doctor is in.